going to be reading from Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 26. 26 through verses 43 of the Gospel of Luke, the third book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospel accounts. If you need a church Bible, just raise your hand. We have some church Bibles, and we can uh, get one to you. There's one, one young man in the back wants a church Bible. There we go. And so Luke chapter 23, I'll be reading from verse 26 through verse 43. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters, my goal today is not to give you a detailed defense of the resurrection of Jesus. There are quite a number of books I could cite in that regard, uh, one, one of them being The Case for Easter uh, by author Lee Strobel, anything, uh, most anything written by William Lane Craig, who is one of the experts on the resurrection. You could, uh, you could read some of his works as well. But what I do want to do is begin by reading a small part of an essay uh, by a Catholic bishop that was recently printed in the Wall Street Journal talking about the reality of the resurrection because we live in a day when there is definitely a palpable suspicion of anything that claims to be truth, um, especially a truth that might have an impact on how uh, people ought to live or a truth that is goes beyond just one culture or one uh, set of people. He says it this way. He says, especially today, it is imperative that Christians recover the sheer strangeness of the resurrection of Jesus and stand athwart all attempts to domesticate it. He says, there were a number of prominent theologians during the years that I was going through the seminary who watered down the resurrection, arguing that it was a symbol for the conviction that the cause of Jesus continues, or simply a metaphor for the fact that his followers, even after his horrific death, felt forgiven by their Lord. But this is all, all utterly, excuse me, incommensurate with the sheer excitement on display in the resurrection narratives and the preaching of the first Christians. 
Can one really imagine St. Paul tearing into Corinth and breathlessly proclaiming that the righteous cause of a crucified criminal endures? Can one credibly hold that the apostles of Jesus went careering around the Mediterranean and to their deaths with the message that they simply felt forgiven, or I would add that they simply believed that they had seen Jesus rise from the dead, but they weren't quite sure. Another strategy of domestication, he says, employed by thinkers from the 19th century to today, is to reduce the resurrection of Jesus to a myth or archetype. There are numberless stories of dying and rising gods in the mythologies of the world, and the narrative of Jesus' death and resurrection can look like just one more iteration of the pattern. Like those of Dionysus, Osiris, and Adonis, the resurrection of Jesus is, on this reading, a symbolic evocation of the cycle of nature. In the philo uh, psychological framework, excuse me, of Carl Jung, the story of Jesus rising, I'm sorry, dying and rising again, is an instance of the classic hero's journey from order through chaos and then to greater order. The problem with these modes of explanation was well articulated by C.S. Lewis. He said, essentially, those who think that the New Testament is a myth just haven't read many myths. Precisely because they, do, they have to do, myths have to do with timeless verities and the great natural and psychological constants, mythic narratives are situated once upon a time, or to bring things up to date now, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> No one wonders who was, who was Pharaoh during Osiris' time, or during which era of Greek history Heracles performed he, his labors, for these tales are not historically specific. But the Gospel writers are keen to tell us that Jesus' birth, for instance, took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and Augustus the emperor of Rome. That is to say, at a definite moment of history and in re reference to readily identifiable, identifiable figures. The Nicene Creed, Creed, recited regularly by Catholics and Orthodox Christians as part of their Sunday worship, states that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate, a Roman official whose image is stamped on coins that we can examine today. Amen? In a speech recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, St. Peter tells his listeners about Jesus, a man from Nazareth, who did great things in Galilee and Judea, who was put to death and whom God raised from the dead. Then he adds, almost as an aside, that he and the other apostles ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. That is just not the way myth-makers talk. Moreover, the Greek word used most often by St. Paul to characterize the message is euangelion, which carries the sense good news. The myths of a dying and rising God and the story of the hero's adventure might be intriguing or illuminating or maybe inspiring, I would add. But one thing they are not is simply news. Paul wasn't trading in abstractions or spiritual bromides. He wanted to take everyone he spoke to by the shoulders and tell them about something that had happened. Something so stunning that it changed the world. And at the heart of his euangelion, his good news, was the resurrection. So the rest of the message is not a detailed defense of the resurrection, but I just want to set the stage because... We live in a day when there is great suspicion over any person who claims to have truth. Because in our culture it's seen as a power play that you, that you can use truth or your supposed truth to, to assert authority over others. But as Tim Keller so uh, insightfully says, he says, well, there's nothing wrong with claiming exclusive truth. It depends on what that exclusive truth is. And here we have a savior who prays for his enemies in his dying moments. Amen? So my objective now is to examine the interaction between Jesus and these two criminals who were crucified with him. And the reason I want to do that is because if Jesus has indeed risen, if Jesus has indeed risen, something that the Christian accepts by faith, 
but yet I think is completely reasonable when you look at the evidence, then the question of how each of us interprets Jesus' death upon the cross is the existential question of our lives. That is, if the resurrection is true, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, then his death upon the cross, which he predicted and talked about, has utmost significance. And the choice before each one of us, you and I, which is a daily choice, is whether we see Christ's death as a contradiction, as a fallacy, as simply a series of un unfortunate events, or do we see it as a confirmation of our own need? Do we see it as a confirmation of the fact that there is this our God who is a forgiving God with deep mercy? Do we see it as the truth that meets our deepest hunger and thirst, the truth that gives us a reason for living? One of the scriptures talking about the death and resurrection of Christ is, it says, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The stone the builders rejected had become the capstone. And my, my urge, urging to you today is that Jesus will either be the cornerstone of your life or he will be the stone that crushes you on judgment. That is the reality of what the Bible teaches. One criminal saw Jesus' death as a contradiction, and the other saw it as a confirmation of his own need for salvation. That is, one saw Jesus as a naive martyr with a misguided mission. The other saw Jesus' death as proof of his messiahship. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's recognizing that Jesus is the king. And today I want to challenge you and ask you, which one are you more like? And there will be a time at the end of our service before and during our final song for you to respond to that in prayer. Well, one thing we notice as we glance at this text is that Jesus' crucifixion was a very public event. It's interesting to me in light of uh, what I opened with, that article about the, the realities of the resurrection or the, the historical narrative is that in the Gospel of Mark, I think it says this man, Simon of Cyrene, who was the one who was to carry Jesus, the cross beam for Jesus, uh, one of the Gospels mentions that, that Simon of Cyrene was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why throw that in there? Why would one of the Gospel authors just say, oh yeah, this guy that carried the cross beam for Jesus, he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why would he just toss in that information? Because Alexander and Rufus were probably living, and people knew who they were when the gospel stories were compiled, the gospel accounts were compiled. His crucifixion was a very public event. Look at verse 27. And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. And Jesus was so exhausted by the scourging and the beating that Simon was forced to carry the crossbar, the cross beam. The Romans were experts at uh, the death penalty, and crucifixion was probably one of the most uh, cruel forms of uh, execution. It was an effective deterrent because it was very public and very uh, it took, a, took a long time. Jesus died relatively quickly compared to other people who were crucified. Sometimes it would take over a day for them uh, to die on a cross. But Jesus turns and he says to these women, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. He's speaking about years later in the year 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple. And the year, in the years that followed, it was written that the Romans crucified Jews in such number that there was no more room for crosses. He's speaking about the, the coming destruction of Jerusalem. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is, when it is dry? 
So you have a multitude of people observing this and watching this, and it was a very, very public event, and, and I was... I was thinking about this. If you if you had, I mean, Jesus' uh, mother and his brothers, uh, if you had a family member who faced this kind of death penalty in the Roman world and was going to be crucified, with, I mean, part of me thinks, well, I would just go somewhere else. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even watch. But I think they watched because this was their final moment with their Savior, with with their Rabbi. This was their final moment to see him. And so they were, they were lamenting for him, and they, they, were, they were expressing their love for him in his moments of pain. See how the other people responded, though. Not by lamenting, not by mourning. There was a lot of mocking. The guards cast lots to divide his garments. Just think of the shame and humiliation of that. Someone dividing up your clothing. And there you are, half naked on the cross. The Jewish rulers scoffed at him. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God. The soldiers mocked him. If you are the king, save yourself. It's ironically significant that Pilate wrote king of the Jews on the, the plate above the cross. And one of the gospels says that it was written in Greek and Aramaic and in Latin. And uh, that he, Pilate got flack for that because the, the Jewish leader said, well, make it say that he claimed he was the king of the Jews, or he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, well, what I have written, I have written. And it's one of those many instances in Scripture through the providence of God that people's actions are of greater significance than what they realize. The other people didn't think he was a king at all. If you are a king, save yourself. Can you hear the echoes of that mocking in our culture today? Not only mocking of Jesus, but simply the exaltation of self. If you really have authority and power, take care of yourself first. In order to promote a good image, a good self-image, you need to take lots of selfies. What an appropriate name for a culture that is drawn towards self. I don't know if the authors of, do they still have Self magazine? There was a magazine out a while, Self. Right. I guess selfies have replaced Self magazine. I don't know, maybe they, maybe they weren't thinking of that when they created Self magazine. But th this is the kind of mockery. What kind of ruler are you, Jesus? How could you let such a horrible thing happen? How could you, couldn't you prevent this kind of tragedy if you were the Messiah? And you hear it in our day. How, how can I worship a God who would let such, such a terrible thing as coronavirus happen? How can, how can God, how can you let these mass shootings happen? Jesus, if you're the Messiah, why don't you do something about that? I remember my first job out of college was teaching at a high school, and I was helping with the swimming team, and, and one of the young girls on the swim team unfortunately committed suicide. And I was talking with the swim team members afterwards in the days following, and I can remember one uh, young woman being very, very upset, and she said, she said, Mr. Folk, this, this young girl was in, was in terrible need, and God didn't do anything. Sometimes we have that anger against God, which sometimes it can, it can draw us to him. We need to express our anger at God, but not stay angry at God. But there is a definite sense of Exalting the self and mocking of Jesus. The more we exalt the self, the more we mock Jesus or resent Jesus because things haven't turned out the way we wanted them to turn out. The first criminal saw the cross as a contradiction because he saw Jesus as only as the solution to his immediate problem. He was making a demand essentially. The first criminal's words, 
in verses, verse 39. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Are you not the Christ? If you were really who you say you are, you would do something about my problem. Brothers and sisters, if our interaction with God consists primarily of only praying to Him when you have an immediate need, or only giving thanks to Him when you have received something favorable, or simply seeking Him on demand and expecting that He solve a particular issue. We live in a culture that is on demand, don't we? Everything's on demand. You can have instant access to this on all your devices. And so then when we, when we pray in our relationship with God and the answer doesn't come within the next four seconds, we go, wait, what's going on? I live in an on-demand world. Shouldn't I have an on-demand God? If we seek him only on demand and expect that he solve a particular issue, or we revile him when he doesn't deliver us from a particular trial. If those, are, are, those things are the essence of our interactions with God, then we don't have a relationship with God if that's, if that's what is primarily our interactions with God. Instead, you would have an arrangement with God where you expect God to serve you. You have decided that you do not need his forgiveness. I was thinking about this this week, that isn't it fascinating that we live in a culture where all of us, myself included, all of us are so quick to point out when we think somebody else should apologize or ask forgiveness our first thought is not usually, boy, what do I need to ask forgiveness for? What do I need to apologize for? What do I need to make right? You see, I mean, you see it all over our culture. One person uses offensive words, and then there's, a, there's an apology that's immediately demanded on Twitter. And there's a firestorm if that, if that person doesn't immediately recant what they said. but thousands and thousands of people who are tweeting, I don't know, are they really searching their own hearts? What have I said that's hurtful? What have I done that's against God's will? What have I, what have I, how have I acted in malice or slander against others? See, if we have a God, an arrangement where we think God is on demand, then we have essentially said to him, I don't think I really need your forgiveness. Instead of confessing and asking forgiveness, we ask, can't you do this for me, Jesus? I can get that way at times. But my point is simply this, like the first criminal who was crucified with Jesus, if that is the essence of our interactions with God, then we have to take a look at where our relationship with God stands. The first criminal missed the meaning of the cross because he was focused on temporary self-preservation. Temporary self-preservation. I've noticed, I think, over this last year, since we've had all these restrictions because of the pandemic, that among Christians and non-Christians, there seems to be a greater and greater urge for self-preservation. And what I mean by that is not only the health risk, but the, the urge to hunker down and protect what I have from any outside influence. And there's a reason to take certain precautions, but brothers, brothers and sisters, we are to be people who trust in the sovereignty of God. Amen. Esther goes before the king and she says, if I perish, I perish. We shouldn't just say, oh, that was nice for Esther, but you know, me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lock down myself and I'm going I'm to uh, you know, take every precaution possible. 
We should be ready to give our lives for the Lord. We don't, we don't want to go out there and, and, and get sick or, or take unnecessary risks. But what I'm saying is that we have to fight that urge that says preserve self, protect self. Because Jesus says whoever tries to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. You see, Jesus isn't asking us to preserve self because he says, I have you in the palm of my hand. My sheep know my voice and I lead them out. And I, I have to fight that. That urge because I say, well, wait, there's, there's ungodly influences out there. I, I need to protect myself from them. Well, yeah, there's, there's a sin nature in here too that can, that can distract me pretty well and get me to fall into sin. Of course we take reasonable precautions, but the scripture says, uh, the catechism says, what is our hope in life and in death? What is our only hope in life and in death? That we belong body and soul to our Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, there's, there's a sense in which Jesus, our Savior and Lord, he knows the road ahead. He is the captain of our salvation. The author of our salvation. That means he has gone before us. And anything that we experience in life, he has already walked through and said, this is the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow me. Brothers and sisters, this first criminal on the cross did not have another go round. Someone commented, well, yeah, the, the, the other thief was saved at the 11th hour. Yeah, but not many are saved at the 11th hour. <laughs> this criminal on the cross did not have another go round. He faced death that day, and none of us knows whether or not we will return next week when we walk out this door today. None of us knows that. And the reality is that the finality of death is the reason why only asking Jesus to solve your immediate problem is short-sighted. The Christian goal is not to preserve or extend life, their own, our own lives at all cost. Because we, we have one who has given us eternal life. I go through that sometimes with people who say, well, I've been to church and that, that church and Jesus, that just, that just didn't work for me. Again, I think that's a, a short-sighted view of looking at things, of, of asking Jesus to be there on demand, to, to make my life better for a time. And then when I'm doing better on my own, then I don't really need the church or I don't really need God. The first criminal saw the cross as a contradiction because he wanted Jesus to solve his immediate Problem. He was concerned primarily about self-preservation. Now, it's good to be concerned about the state of your own soul. Of course it is. But he wanted to preserve simply his physical life. What the one criminal was blind to, the other criminal was able to see, that the cross is the confirmation of his own sinful state. And he saw the reality of God's forgiveness in Christ. Instead of making a demand on Jesus, he made a request for something he knew he did not deserve. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I think the words of verse 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I think the words that Jesus uttered this criminal, those words hit home for him. Here is the one who has done nothing wrong, praying that his enemies would be forgiven. And so this man realizes he needs forgiveness, not only for his crimes against Rome, he was guilty of uh, some crime for which he was put to death, but because next to him is the sinless one. His only hope to be saved from eternal hell is the Lord is Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the one next to him. 
He recognizes the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 40, but the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He recognizes, I think, the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. And he makes a request for something that he knows he does not deserve. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, one of my favorite verses says, For our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I want to ask you today, have you prayed that, that prayer? Father, forgive my sins as a request for the grace that you know you do not deserve. I hope you can say that you have. And I hope that you have the assurance that the Holy Spirit gives when he comes into your heart and, and gives you new life and gives you the assurance of salvation. Lord, remember me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now look at the promise in verse 43. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is a, a word that was uh, taken into the Greek language, uh, originally a Persian word, and refers to essentially a garden. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, to refer to the Garden of Eden. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, it's called the Paradise of God. And so the idea is that Jesus the King here is, is promising that immediate bliss to this man who is on, at death's door. It's saying, you will be with me in paradise, in this place where God dwells, in this place where a king would offer a, a garden to a, a person that he wanted to give honor to. And he would welcome them into that garden and they would have access to that. In Revelation chapter 21, it says, the dwelling of God is with man. So it's the promise of immediate bliss with Jesus. Remember in the book of Genesis, in the early chapters, it says, the Lord walked with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day. And so you have, you have a, a, par a parallel there with what Jesus is saying now. And he's saying, he's saying you will be with me in immediate bliss bliss. Today. Think about the word today in the scriptures. I was thinking about that. Luke chapter 2, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 4, Jesus reads the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Luke chapter 5, when the people saw Jesus' miracles and healings, they, they were filled with awe and said, we have seen something ama some amazing things today. Luke 19, Jesus sees Zacchaeus by the road and he says, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. And then Zacchaeus repents and gives, his, uh, gives back what he owes uh, plus much more. To those he has taken money from and, he, and Jesus says today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 now is the favorable time now is the day of salvation brothers and sisters I want to just urge you and ask you is the cross is Jesus on the cross and his death and his resurrection is that to you a contradiction or is it a confirmation? Is it, is it the most amazing truth that you can ever understand and comprehend? Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And then Romans chapter 9, verse 33. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. 
And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Notice the contrast in that verse. I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But whoever trusts in him will never be put to shame. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus will either be the cornerstone of your life, or he will be the rock that crushes you. I want to close with several stanzas from a poem by John Updike. Uh, the poem is called Seven Stanzas at Easter. And apparently John Updike won a $100 prize for submitting this, this uh, poem to an art contest at a church uh, somewhere in New England. I'm not sure exactly where. But I'm going to read just four stanzas of this poem. And what, what uh, John Updike was pushing back against was the, the uh, idea that I talked about initially that uh, there are attempts to mythologize or, or sort of make the resurrection this, this uh, uh, symbolic event instead of a reality that carries with it the weight uh, of truth. Seven stanzas at Easter, I'll read four of them. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's disillusion did not reverse, the molecule re the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping, transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back, not paper mache, not a stone in a story, but the vast rock of materiality that in the slow grinding of time will eclipse for each of us the wide light of day. Let us not seek to make it less monstrous for our own convenience, our own sense of beauty, lest awakened in one unthinkable hour we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed by the remonstrance. Jesus is either the cornerstone of our lives or he is the rock that will crush those who do not believe in him. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond in faith and I would just urge you today if, if you feel the Holy Spirit tugging your heart to the Lord, uh, if you would... Uh, if you wouldn't mind, during this last song, you can come forward and I'll pray with you uh, uh, up front here. And just think about these truths. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bring the truth of your word home to our hearts. Lord, I know my explanations uh, sometimes uh, are, are short of, of what, we, what, what is exactly for, for our understanding. I've done my best, Lord, to explain the reality of these two criminals who were crucified on either side of you. One of them, Lord, is with you now, and we praise you and rejoice in that, that we will get to meet him one day. Are you that man that said, Lord, remember, remember me today when you come into your kingdom? And he'll nod his head and say, yes, that was me. And we will be amazed because you are a God of deep mercy. Holy Spirit, show us in our hearts what we need to make right with you. Maybe that's confessing our sins for the first time. Maybe that's just simply uh, confessing our sins of the past week or day. Maybe it's just giving thanks to you when we haven't given thanks in a while. Holy Spirit, change our hearts now. As we pray, 
And as we worship, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to work among us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together this final song, Jesus is our living hope. And if you desire to pray about something, I would just urge you to come forward and I'll be here at the front to pray with you.